Hello, everyone. We bless you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Shalom to you. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Haggai chapter 1, verse 4 says, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Is it time for that? Father, we know that these words that you spoke in many years ago have a reference and a, a meaning for us today. Lord, that you are talking to us about the temple of the Holy Spirit that was designed from before the foundation of the earth, the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple in which our God dwells is his people. And is it a time for us to take care of all of the external things and not take care of this thing? We desire today that you would teach us, show us, Father, teach us things we didn't even know we didn't know. Teach us about them. Show us how they work. Bring to our understanding the things that, that are so critical for our lives today. Lord, I pray that you'll open the eyes of hearts to, to see how important the Word of God is. And that when we have problems in our life, the first thing we need to be doing is looking to the Word, looking to the teachings of the Word of God, letting the Holy Spirit bring those things alive in our lives, making ourselves available to the, the preaching of the Word, the teaching of the Word, the reading of the Word, and most of all, making ourselves available unto you, Holy Spirit. We want you to teach us and show us your Word, the Word of God says that the Holy Spirit teaches all things and brings to our remembrance the things that Jesus said. And so today, we thank you that we will be taught. Father, we praise you. We will be taught. We do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Is it a time, Haggai 1.4, is it a time for yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, in your furnished houses, in your, uh, it doesn't have to be a lavish house, your comfortable houses. <laughs> Could be lavish. Most of us, if we, if we really think about it, compared to many people in the world, we live lavishly. We really have a lot. God has blessed us with so much. It's amazing to me that God has blessed this nation with so much and there are people that are bent on tearing it down if in case you don't know who's doing that it's the devil behind all of that it's the enemy that's behind it you need to understand what's going on and we need you to recognize who you are today in Christ Jesus and you are the temple of the Holy Spirit amen hallelujah we know that because first Corinthians 3.16 says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The prophets, speaking way back, this is quoted in the book of Hebrews, but it was spoken before, because it's talked about, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, this is speaking of Jesus, when he was born into this world, when he left heaven to come to this world. That, at that time he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body hast thou prepared for me. And Jesus in his great love came, left glory, and was born into a human body for the purpose of being a sacrifice for sin for a purpose of carrying the anointing here in the earth to show all of us the victory that is in the anointing, the anointing that God had. When Jesus was here, God dwelled in him. Amen. That's what the anointing is all about. God dwelled in him. He dwelled in him. But then that wasn't what he said as was the final of this. After he gave himself a ransom, laid down his life for us, 
before he went back to heaven. He was letting us know that the works that he was doing were the same works that we were to do. Now, I'm telling you what, if we do those works that Jesus did when he was here on this earth, if we, the body of Messiah, do those works, there will be a great awakening in this earth. A great awakening in this earth. The world is not used to this because we've been dwelling in our paneled houses and we haven't been doing what the Holy Spirit on the inside of us is beckoning us to do. So Jesus had a body prepared for him, but that's got double reference. Not only was it his human body that he was born into and walked into for those 30, 33 years here on this earth before he ascended back into heaven, but then he told us we're going to take over and I believe a body thou hast prepared for me also refers to us, the body of Messiah. The body of Messiah equals the temple of the Holy Spirit. You need to get this. This is connected. The body of Messiah equals the temple of the Holy Spirit. The temple of the Holy Spirit is the same thing as the body of Messiah. That's who we are. That's what we're to do. That's what we're to be. And so here, once again, in 1 Corinthians 6, he, he asked that question, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you're not your own? I've got news for some of you. you I hear people all the time say, It's my body. You just keep your religion away from my body. No, the fact is, no matter who you are, your body belongs to God. Now, will he let you make bad choices with your body? Yes, he will, because of free will. The reason for free will, in case you haven't known it, is because love is exercised in free will. And God tells us to love him, but I'm telling you what, for you to love him, you have to exercise your will to do it. I say it. Lord, I love you. I praise you. I worship you. I love you, Lord. Amen. This is the body that God has clothed my spirit with, but it belongs to him. It belongs to him. I'm not my own. And this being that I am is not my own. I belong to God. You say, well, boy, that's just really something that you just... Just give up everything to belong to God. Do you know what? He takes care of me a lot better than I ever could. When I yield myself to him, I am well cared for in every way. He does me no harm. He does me only good. Amen. God loves me with an everlasting love. And he's teaching me about the, the meaning of love and what it means to love him. He has taken that love that he has for us. And he's actually, by the Spirit, shed it abroad into us by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. And this is the way that we can operate. Without this, we could not operate as his temple. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Those are the things of hate, hate speech, hatred, judgment. And what has he replaced it with? God's love. God is love. He's inside, and the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. You know the scripture that says, we know that all things work together for good. Did you ever stop and think what it says right after that? We know that all things work together for good for those who love God Where's that love come from? From him in the first place. We love him and we're called. You know, it doesn't work together for good for everybody. It doesn't even work together for every Christian. Why? Because some are not allowing that love of God 
All things work together for those who love God, actively love Him, and allow Him to direct them, called according to His purpose. Amen. You've got to get this down. If you don't get this down, you'll just be wandering around saying scriptures that you don't really understand. All things work together for good. And the baby died, and some well-meaning person said, Oh, God needed him in heaven. That wasn't a fact at all. The devil comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. Jesus comes to bring us life and to give it to us more abundantly. We don't normally think about that scripture, all, all things work together for good in speaking of the temple of God, but I want you to know that's exactly the, the, the thing that the, uh, the force, the force of love begins to work in the body and that's what brings this to pass that God considers us his temple is a temple that's filled with love, a temple of God filled with God, and God is love, and he shed that love abroad in his house. Where is house? Where is house? You get this? You need to get this. You need to start understanding that if you're the temple of God, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, then it's because you are connected together with others of like precious faith who have the love of God in them also. That's how we're built up into a holy temple for God. We're built up. You're not your own. We're part of that body. I belong to you if you're born again and, and serving God. You belong to me. We work together. I don't mean ownership in the sense of, of control. I mean we belong together. We'll explain this more as time goes on here, but you'll begin to understand more and more that you're not complete without me. I'm not complete without you. And you who think I can come and go because I am a free moral agent and I have choices to do it, you can. But you know what? You'll never be a success in the kingdom of God as long as those attitudes are in you and you have no regard for the body of Messiah. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That's what the scripture says. Why? Why is that important? You know, it's so important, and yet people have taken that very scripture and made a, uh, a legalistic law out of it. We're not talking legalism here. We're talking about the fact that if you belong to me and I belong to you, and you go off and do your own thing, you're robbing me. If I go off and do my own thing, I'm robbing you. If God would give me a prophecy for you, and I don't deliver it, would I be robbing you of something? Very precious. If God has given me an action to do for you, and I don't do it, am I robbing you of a blessing that God had intended for you? Yes. What will God do? He'll find someone else to, to minister it to us through. But the fact is, we're robbing one another when we don't see this truth. And it's not just enough to attend a meeting. You need to develop a whole new attitude about what it means to come together. Amen. We're talking about the body of Messiah. We're talking about the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Romans chapter 4. 12, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 12. It talks about the body in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 and verse 4. Let's go to verse 5. Well, actually, let's just go ahead and read 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all the members have not the same office, verse 5 says, so we being many are one body in Christ. You remember that one of our first lessons on uh, the body was one body, one body. The second one after that was one head. We're one body, and Jesus is the head. We're the body of what? Christ. We're the body of Messiah. And Jesus is the head of that body. Everyone is members of 
one of another. Man, I'll tell you what. Just like your body can't function if you just cut your arm off and tell it to get something, it won't do it. Why? It's not connected to the head anymore. Isn't that right? And the body without the head is what? Dead. It's dead. So we have to stay connected to the head. But you know what? The head can still be working through the rest of the body, but if one part of the body is cut off, what happens? It can't function as, as the Lord has desired for it. The Bible says he sets all the members in the body as it pleases him. As it pleases him. We're one body and every one of us members of one another and we have gifts. Say gifts. Now you know what your gifts are. Some of you, some of you are very vocal. Some of you are, in fact, some of you actually have become too vocal. You've become, what well, is a six dollar word here, loquacious. You talk more than you should. Here's the problem. It's not that you're talking, it's what you're talking about, what you're speaking to. And some people think they have to have an opinion about everything. We don't need that. But I'll tell you very honestly, the people who are that way have a gift of speaking. It just needs to be controlled. You know the scripture says, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, right? The mouth speaks from what's going on in your heart. Now, I, you know, this should tell you your heart can get polluted. Your heart can get polluted by things you're thinking on. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when the mouth speaks, the scripture says in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in that power of the tongue. So in other words, sometimes when you speak and you're speaking death, you're not speaking for God. You're speaking for the enemy. Listen to me now. Some of you have not understood that when you open your mouth and criticize or even rail against somebody, some of us think we have the right to just accuse other people, whether we do it to their face or not, some of us think we have the right to cuss one another. Not only cuss, but actually curse, speak evil of. Some of us accuse one another. You know who the accuser of the brethren is, don't you? The devil. The devil. If you've been doing it, you better, you better realize who you're dealing with, because when you deal with the devil and you give of yourself to the devil, he doesn't stop he takes more. The Bible says give no ground to the devil. I know somebody here today, somebody listening to me today, someone that listens to this recording really needs to hear this, and I believe the Holy Spirit is saying that quite a few of us need to make some big changes in the way we speak, what we say, what we think about others, because we're members one of another. Members one of another. Now, what about the unbelievers? Well, you're never going to win them by cursing them. You're going to win them by blessing them. How do you bless them? Gospel. The good news. You bless people by speaking the good news to them. Amen? The good news. You let everyone know that they are valuable and precious in the sight of the Lord. Everyone valuable and precious. The worst sinner in the world still valuable and precious to God. God would never send anyone to hell, but many people will end up in hell because they chose to serve this devil I'm talking about. Chose to speak for him instead of speaking for God. Amen. Amen. We're one body in Christ. So having gifts according to the grace that's given to us. Where does grace come from? Well, grace is God's giving when you see grace in the Bible, it's talking about giving. God gives. He's a grace-giving God. He's a merciful God. 
He's grace giving. And according to that grace, in other words, what are we talking about? The gifts. Gifts that differ come from the grace where, that he's given. And God has set you with certain gifts. Some of you have a gift of being generous. And it doesn't necessarily mean, as I've said before, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a lot to give, but what you have, you're willing to share. You're, you're just that way. You want to give. It's a gift. Now, can it be misled? Absolutely. The devil will do that. In fact, he's made people poor that way. He's made people poor by telling them if they give something to someone, that they, you know, they're supposed to go ahead and, and give more than they, uh, than they have. Did you know people have written hot checks as offering checks before? Say, I've just got to give, I've got to give, and I, I'm just believing you, God, that I'm going to write a hot check here tonight, and you're going to put the money in my account to cover it. That's, that's not God doing that. That's the enemy working. So don't be misled, but you may have that, that gift to prophesy. You say, what is prophesy? Well, of course, we know of the gift of prophecy, the gift of prophecy, but there is a prophesy which just talks about one who speaks out. There are others who teach. There are others who govern and administer things. That's true. There's people needed to do all kinds of things. I'm so glad that there's ways of getting bookkeeping done that I don't have to know everything myself. That's a gift. Amen. Ways people know how to do that. People know how, and God's gifted them to do things like that. Gifts that work in the body. There are gifts of helps. I like that gift a lot because you know what a gift of helps will do? A gift of helps is one that says, what needs to be done? What needs to be done? Now, you, you think that you're supposed to come to the pastor to ask that, but what would happen if you went first to God and say, what needs to be done and he said, in this congregation, this needs to be done. Now you go talk to the pastor and ask him if you heard right. <laughs> and I guarantee if you come to this pastor and you say, God's been dealing with me about doing this. And I, I know that you're trustworthy. I'm going to say, yes, yes, do it. If you're one of those people that always has a better idea, you always want to reform everything and reorganize everything, you know, that makes me think your flesh is into it. You understand what I'm saying? There's people like that, that they just, when they do anything, they, they go beyond the scope of their authority. And we need to be careful about that. Now, I'm not here to teach you all about all these various gifts, but I am here to tell you today that you may have a gift that's totally different from me. And the, you know why God does that? God reaches all kinds of people through different kinds of people, through different kinds of gifts. Amen. You know, there's people that will relate to you that will not relate to me. There's people that will listen to you that if you took my message and played it for them, they wouldn't get it. But if you spoke it from your lips and told them in your way what God is saying, they'd hear you. If you showed them love the way you do, they'll hear you. Are you listening to me? It's important that you get this. It's important that you get this. Where does the, where does the gifting come from? The grace comes from God. But you know what? In the body, we would say, the grace comes from the head. Just like in your body, your head has a thought and says, I'm going to walk over here. And then your body obeys it. You don't even have a consciousness that that's happened. You just all of a sudden know that you want to go over here and your head tells your feet and your arms, your legs, Everything kind of cooperates. You notice when you walk, you don't just walk like this. You walk with the arm swing. Why is that? Because everything is balanced. God has balanced everything. And there's more to this than meets the eye. 
We need to get that down. Yes, 1 Corinthians 12, 14 tells us the body is not one member, but many. We are many members. Listen, I could name all the gifts that are shown, and some of you would have a, a, actually a gifting that I haven't mentioned. That's true. God has many, many gifts, but they may fall into major headings, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of different ways that he manifests his gifts in his body. It, he manifests them. How does he do that? How does he, how does he work these gifts in us? Ephesians 4, 7 says, But unto every one is given grace. There it is again, that word grace, the gift. We're given grace according to what? According to the measure, say measure. How many of you know about measures? Weights and measures. We have measures, measures. Well, what that indicates to me, and I believe this is what the Holy Spirit showed me, is that no one of us have the full gift of the anointing, the full gift of Messiah as Jesus walked in it while he was here on this earth. But it takes the whole body to make up for all these things, and each one of us has a measure. You have a measure, you have a measure, you have a measure, you have a measure. And with those measures, all together now, the head is able to use us as the full anointing of Messiah. Amen. Amen. You know, sometimes I know that there's a bit of a prophetic anointing that works in me. But by and large, if you were to ask me what is the gift of God in me, I can tell you very quickly, it's teaching. I am a teacher in the body of Messiah. I am not to do all the work of the, of the, that I teach, but I am to teach people to work with me to accomplish these things. I teach. I teach. And some, especially people who also have a gifting in teaching, will be drawn often to a teaching ministry. That's a fact. People who have a gifting in the prophetic ministry will be drawn to a prophet. People who have a gifting to go into all the world and preach the gospel themselves, making physical trips, flying here and there, going here and there, sailing here and there, walking here and there, you know, they're apostolic. God's teaching them and gifting them according to that going. Well, I've done some going, but I would not call that my strong suit. I've loved what I've done, but that's not where I feel the Lord wants me. Primarily, where does he want me in a local assembly? Teaching. I thank God that he has opened the door for us to teach by means of internet, with a camera, with sound systems, that we can teach from where we are and literally go into the all the world. But you know what? It's not the same as when somebody sits in your house. I've, I've gone into people's homes and eaten with them in, in uh, Myanmar, sat in a in a house with some people and ate. I've done that in the Philippines. I've done that in different places that I've been. I've done that in the Caribbean, gone into their homes. There's a difference. There's a difference when you can go up to someone and, and hug them. I love this ministry. Don't get me wrong. It's great that we can go online and reach people. But, you know, I can't touch you like I'd like to. I can't minister to you in the same way that I could if we could sit down together. But my gift is teaching. And I can touch you with these teaching words. And if you'll receive these teaching words, if you'll decide that it's really important to hear them and receive them into your life, they'll change you. They'll change you. Not because I'm so smart, but because I have an anointing to do this. It's according to the grace that was given unto me, according to that measure teaching of the gift of Christ. Was Jesus a teacher? The greatest teacher that ever lived. Amen. And I have a little bit of his teaching anointing, a measure of it. I have a measure of it. 
And the gift of Christ literally means the gift of the anointed one, the gift from the anointed one, which is the same anointing that he had in us. Amen. Now, quantitatively, it's not all of the anointing. But qualitatively, the quality of it is just as good as it was in him. Oh, man, that is amazing. How can that happen? By the anointing. By the anointing. So read with me from Psalm 133. Psalm 133. Behold. The first verse says, Behold. Look. Look how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Well, we use this. In fact, there's a, a Hebrew song. Hineim atov naim shevet achim hamyahad which means, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Yahad, unity. Echad in Hebrew, in unity. But you know what we, we've missed, I think, is how this is supposed to work all the time in the entire body of Messiah, and that working together in the body of Messiah is the temple that God works from, the operation center here in this earth. Amen. He's using different ones of us in different places all the time, but together it builds up into the unity of the body of Messiah. What does it say? It is like the precious ointment. Would you be surprised to know that the precious ointment, the Shemin ointment, refers to the anointing. It is like the anointing upon the head. That's what that ointment on Aaron's head was. Who was Aaron? Who was Aaron? Aaron was the brother of Moses. Aaron was of the tribe of Levi. But more than anything, Aaron will always be known as the first high priest for God. The first high priest. So what is he? He's an example for us of what it's supposed to be like. An anointing is what was required for Aaron to do his job. What's required for us, that same anointing. That anointing that is Jesus, the Messiah. That it ran down Aaron's beard. Even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. <laughs> how good and how pleasant it is to walk in the anointing. Do you believe that? Listen, the anointing is the key. The anointing is what removes the burden. From who? From anyone that will listen and let you do it. The anointing will remove burdens from people. It will destroy the yokes of bondage from people. That's what the anointing is about. And that's what the house of God here on this earth is the center for that. And we, the priesthood of God, the body of of Messiah, his high priests, there's one high priest, he's the head, Jesus, but we're high priests under him, doing what? Ministering the things of God. What does God do? The same works that Jesus did. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, and that's the kind of priest you are. That's the kind of anointing you have. That same anointing. Listen what the scripture says in Colossians 2.2. 2, that their hearts might be comforted. Now, just let me back up just a tad. I'm not going to back up in Colossians, but just tell you what goes before. That in the last chapter, at the end of the first chapter, Paul's talking about being concerned. In fact, I believe this is a part of a prayer that Paul was praying for people right here. That their hearts might be comforted. How would you be comforted? What does comforted mean? Comforted means helped, doesn't it? It means to be helped. When you're comforted, you're helped. It isn't just, I'm, I feel warm and cozy. It, it has to do with being helped. It ha has to do with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. He teaches us all things, and he brings to our remembrance the things Jesus said. You know, there's nothing like that you got a problem in your life and you have the Holy Spirit speak things to you. Man, I'll tell you what, you talk about comfort. 
That's a comfort that is so great you just can't even begin to uh, quantify. You can't even begin to uh, tell how valuable that is. That their hearts might be comforted being what? Knit together. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Knit together. Same thing. Unity, knit together in love. In what? In love. We started talking about the love of God. God is love. Amen. You know, to even say the love of God indicates that it just might be an attribute. But God is love, according to Scripture, which seems to me to be more central than an attribute. I have many attributes. But God is love, and then he has attributes, doesn't he? God is a faith God, right? But God, before he is a faith God, is love. He is love. And you know what? That same love that's in him, we're being knit together with it in the body. The body works together in love, not only toward one another in the body, which is not, not exactly uh, common. <laughs> it, certainly isn't, uh, it certainly isn't the, uh, the normal way things are done anymore. I mentioned one time that committees sessions, uh, church boards, councils, congresses, those things, you rarely ever hear anybody say, yeah, they work together in love, do you? No, they don't work together in love. But we, this body which is made to be a temple for the Holy Spirit, this is God's plan, that we'll work together in love. You say, well, where's that been all this time? People have decided that there is a necessary way of us forming human governments. I know of uh, denominations that think they take credit for the way the United States government was formed. And by the way, there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of clergy in the formative years of that. And of course, the things that, that happened that really matter. By the way, did you know that the United States government and constitution is not a perfect document? No, it's not. Do I want to get rid of it? Absolutely not. But it's not perfect and we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that. But at the same time, it's good. I think it's the best thing on earth. But having said that, God does not rule by unanimous consent. And you need to know this. Their hearts be comforted being knit together in love and under the riches of the full assurance of understanding. That's that's the place right there, full assurance of understanding. When you really know that you understand what God's saying, then you know what? When you say something and you make a decision on something, it's right. And when a body of believers comes together like that in one accord, then there's something amazing that happens. But I want you to know something. It's not because the individual's are so bright, it's because they have yielded themselves to the head. And then when they do that, even the mystery of God and of the Father and of Messiah Christ is given to them. The acknowledgement of that mystery, the knowing how this is working. What I'm talking to you about today, listen, Many people don't understand this. Many Christians do not understand this. If I started talking like this in some places, I would be thought to be a heretic, that you don't, you don't follow our traditions. Well, you know, I try to follow one tradition above all traditions, and that's God's tradition. And I believe that the governments that have been ascribed and, and uh, actually... Uh, put upon 
local assemblies oftentimes are very troublesome. They cause a lot of problems. They've caused a lot of splits and division. But God doesn't do that. God brings us into unity and into oneness. Amen. Unto the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of Father and of Christ. Colossians 2, 2. Amen. Remember what Jesus prayed, John 17, 21. He's praying for me now, see. He said that they, I'm one of they. You're one of they if you're born again. Listen, if you're born again, you may not be doing what's right, but Jesus is praying for you right here. You may not have understanding of this, but Jesus is praying for you right here, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And the world may believe, oh, you want to see that awakening that I'm talking about? This will be the time when it will happen. When the world can see that we be one and believe that God the Father has sent Jesus into this world. Amen. Hallelujah. That's when it will happen. That's when it will happen. That's what's going to do it. It's not going to happen because, uh, well, we've got a brand new evangelist and he's better than anybody else. No, it's when the body becomes one as Jesus is one. Amen. Amen. Father, let it be. Let it be. Amen, Father, let it be because it's truth. Truth. Your word is truth. Let it be in us today that we be one, even as you're one with the Father, that we walk in that unity. How good and how pleasant it is for we, the brothers and sisters, to dwell together in unity under the head, speaking his words to each one of us the same way, the same, the same message. Hallelujah. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.